My name is Mike Clare. I'm the Associate Director for Public Policy at the Harris Center. I think I know most of you, but we'll do a round of introductions to start, uh, start off. Um, so, Max, uh, why don't we start with you? And your name is Wendy Mumford. <laughs> <laughs> which is a partnership between business and engineering, correct? I'll call and I'll introduce you in a second. Uh, so what we're uh, needing to talk about here is the evolution of entrepreneurial ecosystems. And just like we say that uh, we need a village to raise a child, we need a society to foster entrepreneurship. And so uh, there are creative people all over the world, people who could start a business anywhere in the world, but some places are better at starting businesses than others. And what differentiates those places from other places where it's more difficult to start a business? So the ecosystem within which entrepreneurs operate is really important. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, a couple of housekeeping items first. If you've got a cell phone or anything that's bound to beep or buzz, if you would like to, to set it to the silent mode. Washrooms are outside the door to your left, almost at the end of the corridor. In the unlikely event of an emergency, there is an exit door just outside the door here to your right, and the stairs are there. Otherwise, go out past the elevators. I think there's another set of stairs over there. And there's one at the total end of the hall, but hopefully we won't need to uh, do that. Uh, there is a sign-in sheet at the end. Um, I want, there's a sign-up sheet at the end there. If, if uh, people have not signed it, I wonder if you would sign it, please, because uh, our finance people need that to prove that you were here to eat our sandwiches. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, speaking of sandwiches, help yourself uh, to the food at any time. There's lo loads there. There's coffee and tea, cookies. I'm sure our, our speaker won't mind if you get up and, and get a coffee or something like that. Uh, and uh, the presentation is available to you. We'll distribute it after, so you don't need to take copious notes if you don't need. You know, we'll, we'll circulate that around. I want to thank Blair for initiating the session. Blair is the one who mentioned that the speaker would be here today and, and organize this. So thank you very much, Blair. I also want to recognize Mac, Max Rulock, who is on the, the chair of the advisory board for the Harris Center. And we have a counselor here with us, Dave Lane. So I'm very pleased to have, see you here. Um, do we have somebody online uh, yet? Uh, not yet. So we're expecting at least one person online. If we do get that person, uh, when uh, it's the Q&A session, we're going to circulate a wireless microphone. So please wait until you have the microphone to ask your brilliant question or make your comment. Um, but we'll we'll figure out if we don't need it. So you can hear me in the back, right? So we don't normally need it, but if there is somebody online, we'll uh, we'll use the microphone. Um, we are recording this. Uh, we're recording the presentation part. We're not going to record the conversation. So if you want to criticize your employer, by all means, do so in the Q and A session. We're not going to post that after. Uh, and probably in a day or so, it'll be uploaded if you want to. Um, and we'll send out the presentation as well. 
we're going to finish at 1.30, unless there is an agreement for us to continue, but we'll, we'll normally we'll, we'll end at 1.30. But if, uh, if you guys really want to continue, we'll, we'll do that. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our guest presenter, Dr. Colin Mason is Professor of Entrepreneurship in the Adam Smith Business School, University of Glasgow. Well, the pressure you must be under to be in the Adam Smith business, teaching business in the Adam Smith Business School. His research and teaching are in the area of entrepreneurship and regional development. His specific research interest is in entrepreneurial finance. He's written extensively on business angel investing and has been closely involved with government and the private sector initiatives to promote business angel investment, both in the UK and elsewhere. He has worked with Canada's National Angel Capital Association on their annual reports on angel investment activity, most recently the report on investment activity in 2015. He's also undertaken recent studies of high growth firms and technology firms in Scotland on behalf of Scottish Enterprise. He's got, he goes back a long way with Newfoundland Labrador, uh, coming first in 1985 to teach a summer school. And he's been here several times since. And uh, I think in 2011, you came and yes, did a similar sure. session here, which was uh, greatly appreciated. And uh, that information is still on our website if people are interested. So please uh, welcome back, Colin Mason. Thank you very much. I was in the Australia in the summer, and uh, somebody kept calling me Adam. And I was totally confused that he realized he thought that was my name. <laughs> Yeah, as, as Mike said, um, my first time in Canada was 32 years ago. Um, I did some summer school teaching at the University of Ottawa. In those days, the federal government had a little scheme uh, to kind of promote the, um, knowledge about Canada around the world. They funded university teachers, like an airfare and a little bit of PRDM money in exchange for teaching a course on Canadian studies, which I, I availed myself of several times. When I was in Ottawa uh, in, in 84, I was anyway, a whole bunch um, of I'm an economic geographer by background. Um, but focusing in on entrepreneurship. So my, my question is kind of why are there, uh, why are there geographical variations in, in entrepreneurial activity? Uh, there's a book written by Thomas Friedman that came out a few years ago called The World is Flat. Um, before that, uh, I think it was British Telecom had, uh, had this provocative advert saying geography is dead. Uh, <laughs> Richard Florida. Uh, a normally Canadian, I guess you could say, a couple of years ago, I think in the Atlantic magazine, um, reacted to all this stuff and said, hey, no, the world is spiky. Economic activity is concentrated at particular particular places. Um, so we don't put real activity. So the question, the big question, that, or the, the, the broader question that my presentation is addressing is, why are there geographical variations in entrepreneurial activity? Now, the traditional approach was to see it as being structural. Um, so there's been quite a lot of research by kind of regional economists and geographers showing that the, the, the structure of industry makes a difference. We, we know that there are barriers to entry by industry. Some industries uh, produce more entrepreneurs than others. So the industry makeup of a region matters. Establishment size, we know that the smaller the, the, the workplace, the smaller the size of the organization, the more likely people are to, to leave to set up firms. I think Firms with less than 20 employees, if I remember rightly, the employees have got a 20% greater chance or 20% more likely to start their own business than somebody working in a, a 500 or bigger establishment. So the size structure of your, of, your, of your industry matters. Occupations, again, we know that people who start businesses tend to be skilled manual or managerial workers, not unskilled workers. So if you've got an economy based around uh, branch plants do, doing low, um, low quality work. You're not going to get many many entrepreneurs spinning out. Ownership matters. Um, independent firms spin out more more uh, businesses than, brand, than, than branch plants do. Uh, public sector uh, spins out very few businesses compared to private sector and so on. So that, that gives you a reasonably good explanation for why there are spatial variations in startup rates. It's less effective in, in explaining why there are geographical variations in high growth firms. The, the geography of high growth firms does not map very well onto the geography of startups, which is quite an interesting finding in itself. So there's something else in geographical environments that's influencing where the startups grow. And so the new perspective that's come through is this entrepreneurial ecosystems perspective. Um, now, I can't remember if I say this in other slides or not, uh, whether this is actually saying anything new, that, that cluster theory and 
agglomeration theory and a bunch of other theories didn't already say. Some people have just said, oh, the real ecosystem theory is, is, uh, is old wine in new bottles. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But anyway, Eric Stam from the Netherlands has a little summary definition, a set of independent actors and factors coordinated in such a way that they enable productive entrepreneurship. So that's a beginnings of a, of a definition of entrepreneurial ecosystems. This is a guy called Eisenberg, um, who's one of the big names in, the, in this field. Uh, he comes from Harvard. Uh, and this is his model of the alternate ecosystem. Uh, a thriving alternate ecosystem that generates lots of, of alternate businesses and high growth businesses. We'd have a, a conducive culture to entrepreneurship. Um, we'd have enabling policies and, and leadership, uh, private sector leadership, not, not, not government leadership. Um, there would be available finance, quality human capital would be there, venture friendly markets for products. So there would be companies or organizations willing to uh, be the first customer to innovative firms, uh, for example. Uh, there will be a range of um, institutional support. I forgot to put on there, universities uh, are important as well. So these would be the kind of main elements of, um, of, of an alternative ecosystem. And I guess what you could do would be to kind of take that model and then kind of score your, your particular ecosystem on, on each of these um, dimensions. This is a longer, longer definition. This is one of the reasons I got into this was I was asked in 2014 by OECD to write a kind of background paper on open ecosystems and high growth firms that then was the background for, for a meeting we had in the, in the Hague. So I worked with a colleague of mine called Ross Brown. So we did a slight, somewhat longer definition than Eric did. A set of interconnected entrepreneurial actors, entrepreneurial organizations, institutions, and entrepreneurial processes, which formally and, and informally coalesce to conduct, mediate, and govern the performance within the local entrepreneurial environment. So in the sense that it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle, there are lots of elements that have to be in place and fit together to generate an environment where our businesses get started and grow. I mean, that's, that's essentially what we're, what we're talking about. And ultimately, ecosystems, I would argue, are inherently geographical. They're geographically bounded, but, but not necessarily confined to a specific scale. You can find ecosystems at the city scale, the regional scale, national scale, perhaps if the country's small enough, maybe even at the neighborhood um, scale. And I think perhaps if we think about Atlantic Canada, we might get the idea you can have eco nested ecosystems. So each, each of the main cities has got their own ecosystem, but there's also perhaps a, a pan-Atlantic um, ecosystem perhaps um, as well. There are even industry-specific ecosystems. The just watch industry, I suppose you could think of, again, geographically bounded, but, but more narrowly focused. So what, one of the questions uh, and is when, where, and how do entrepreneurial ecosystems emerge? I mean, you, you, you get the, the Eisenberg diagram, which says this is what an ecosystem looks like. Or you, you, you get various studies of Waterloo or of Silicon Valley or whatever. This is what the ecosystem looks like today. But it doesn't tell us how it gets to that point in time. So that doesn't really help. For example, so I'm ahead of myself, but one of the reasons why I'm Um, maybe some kind of prior industrial tradition. Um, about 50 years ago, I did some research on the Ottawa Tech Cluster, um, 
I just started in 2000 at the peak of the dot com boom and then uh, the downward cycle as well. So you could, you could see how that would apply to Ottawa. Um, it certainly had talent magnets. The, the survey I did of entrepreneurs in Ottawa, not a single person was born and brought up in Ottawa. They'd all come into the economy to get jobs with Nortel or Newbridge Networks or whatever, uh, and then moved around organizations, then started their, their, own, their own businesses. But OK, we maybe have these dormant, dormant assets. What triggers these dormant assets suddenly to become important and actually to, to generate entrepreneurial activity? Some ecosystems might start and develop some momentum and then fall away. Uh, why? Some of the ecosystems like Ottawa boom and then go into decline, but then perhaps re revive again. So there's an important time dimension to the study of ecosystems that, as far as I'm aware, nobody's really um, looked at. So I think, as I say, the best way to answer at least some of these questions is to look at an emerging ecosystem. So let me, the next few slides are really just kind of what the literature says. This is how I've drawn on my OECD um, paper. There are seven or eight different points. First is that, as the name implies, entrepreneurial ecosystems are the drivers of, um, of the growth of ecosystems. I mean, it's somewhat uh, tautologous, mm -hmm. but that's what I think, differentiates the open ecosystem view from, say, clusters, and uh, Porter's clusters view, um, which is more about the organization of, of, of existing firms and their supply chain and stuff like that, or regional innovation systems, which is, again, focused on firms of different sizes and their innovation. The, the difference with the ecosystem view is, is that we're explaining um, the spikiness by focusing uh, entrepreneurial activity. So how do we get lots of entrepreneurial activity happening? It's a spin-off process. And, and a lot of the studies of ecosystems have, have produced kind of corporate genealogies showing where the founders have come from, what organizations they come from. And in most cases I've seen, there are a small number of specific organizations that seem to account for a disproportionate number of the, of the entrepreneurs. So if you look at Cambridge in the UK, for example, Acorn, which pioneered the, the BBC computer, and is now um, that spawned an awful lot of, of, of entrepreneurs. Um, I say in in, uh, in Ottawa, it was it was Nortel, for example. So these organisations attract smart people into the area. Um, again, thinking back to Ottawa, what what these talent magnets were doing were were were, were sucking in um, engineers. But then when they worked for Nortel or whoever, they then got managerial skills kind of grafted on to their, their, their engineering skills. Um, and so they had the, had the company to manage and start businesses. So there was these organizations kind of added to the human capital uh, by enabling people to become technology managers. They also very often became customers of local firms. Um, and potentially could take these firms into global markets. And as Eisenberg says, you simply can't have a flourishing entrepreneurial ecosystem without large companies to cultivate it intentionally or otherwise. A third characteristic is, is what I would, well, the, 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 Dane, the, the Danes instituted this OECD meeting, and the, they had this concept of blockbuster entrepreneurship. The idea that in successful ecosystems, there are a small number, maybe just one, very, very successful um, company that, that uh, kind of makes, like RIM in, in Waterloo would be a good example of, of, of that. Uh, law, I think Eisenberg talks about the law of small numbers. Successful ultra ecosystems are driven by a small number of successes. Ultra firms that grow to exceptional size, create wealth for its founders, investors, senior managers, um, employees, who then all reinvest their wealth, their learning, um, in the ecosystem, as serial entrepreneurs, as business angels, as mentors, as builders of new institutions, and so on. Um, and again, we've got well, various examples of, of, of this process going on. So the growth of entrepreneurial ecosystems then is very much driven by entrepreneurial recycling. The entrepreneurs, the, well, the teams, if you like, rather than the entrepreneurs, we have built up successful companies, which very often then sell to global businesses, may work for these global businesses for a time, maybe that's part of the deal, uh, and then of course they're, they're learning uh, a lot more, they're enhancing their own human capital, 
for working for the buyers of their companies. Um, but ultimately, we'll, we'll leave, reinvest the wealth and expertise in the, the cluster, um, in all these different capacities. Some companies will have multiple um, people who do this from the same company. Again, you can think of a kind of spider di diagram uh, to underline this. Doesn't always happen. Uh, again, people in Ottawa noted that so some of the successful companies in Ottawa, you, it was hard to identify very much entrepreneurial recycling happening from some of these companies. But it, it did happen from so why is, 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 is not clear. But I think the implication is that for an entrepreneurial ecosystem to develop and, and grow, you need periodic big exits, uh, harvest events that free up people, uh, free up the wealth, free up the learning that could get reinvested. If you have an ecosystem where the businesses are getting sold, but at a very small price, then you don't get the wealth, or you don't get much wealth to be recycled, and you don't probably get the, 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 the ultimate experience, the management experience, because the company will only grow in a little bit. Um, so you'll, the ecosystem will lack uh, sources of, of talent where, which are actually involved in, in, in growing companies over, over several stages of their growth. So I'd be worried about a, an ecosystem where a company being sold just for a kind of a few million. Sometimes, paradoxically, failure is the spark that, that, that produces the spin-off process. A company that closes down or make, makes a lot of people um, redundant. Very often, maybe people have been attracted to the area. Um, within a couple of years, uh, they're suddenly faced with having to move again um, because their employer is, is, is closing down, or maybe it's been taken over, or whatever. Uh, and perhaps because of where they are in their family life cycle, or perhaps because they like the area, they'll say, stuff it, I'm going to start my own company here as an alternative to relocation. So sometimes in that scenario, um, a business startup is an alternative to, um, to, to or, or response to, to losing your job. And we can see that in, in various um, cities. There's a study of Boulder by Heidi Neck, and I think, which showed that. Certainly in Ottawa, there was a, I can't remember the detail, but the, the studies talked about a company that was set up to make, make microchips like in the late 90s. It was only in operation for 18 months, attracted a lot of people to Ottawa, closed down, and a lot of these employees went off and started their own, their own businesses. Um, Brad Feld is, is a kind of an entrepreneur, very safe entrepreneur. He wrote a book uh, called Startup Communities, which is kind of one of the, regarded one of the most useful books on entrepreneurial ecosystems. He wrote it about Boulder, which apparently is the most entrepreneurial place in the UK, in the US. So these are some of the things he picked up about why, why Boulder has got such a strong um, entrepreneurial ecosystem. And he's down to culture, a philosophy of inclusiveness. So anyone who comes into Boulder are welcome. Uh, are welcomed in and seen as being valuable assets. Give before you get. So put in your community input, uh, your volunteer work, um, b before you you're necessarily uh, have, have made it. A lot of knowledge sharing. Positive attitudes to failure. Uh, so don't, don't look down on somebody who's, who's failed. Um, porous boundaries. So when somebody leaves, when someone leaves one company for another, they're not shunned. Um, and critically, experienced entrepreneurs play the leadership role in the ecosystem, uh, driving development. And I like this quote: "When a startup community starts relying on government to be the leader, bad things happen." <laughs> Universities are also important in the ecosystem, but again, Fell said perhaps not as important as we've conventionally thought. And indeed, not every successful ecosystem has a successful, uh, well-known university, certainly not a research university. Um, I think they will be misguided by MIT on the assumption that universities spin out lots of, of faculty to start their own businesses. That, that simply uh, doesn't happen in 99.9% .9 of the universities uh, around the world. Um, technology transfer offices, again, are seen as being impediments to commercialization. Uh, rather than actually helping in, in, in the process. Um, and entrepreneurship education is questioned, not least because it's taught in business school, and suggests it should be taught in engineering um, faculties. So the things that, we th that are often thought about why universities are important perhaps aren't. But where universities are important is 
they're, they're a talent magnet, albeit raw talent. They attract students to the area with new ideas. And where the startups come are not from faculty, but from alumni and graduate students and, and postdocs and so on. That's where you get your startups. Uh, you call it what does US sold me? Oh, so university spin-offs. Okay. Uh, yeah. Meaning business started by faculty. Um, right. So um, I don't, I don't, as entrepreneurial systems evolve, we'll, 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 we'll see um, more and more institutions um, coming in. So you'll begin to see finance providers uh, coming in, angels, uh, venture capital. The success of local, so local success stories will spill out to other areas and attract the interest of non-local investors. We'll see the emergence of kind of key people that Jerry Sweeney called liaison animators, kind of people who are key people in the kind of the networks node. You, these people with the great Rolodexes. You find you contact them and they will connect you to lots of other people. Um, in some of some respects, is the same idea. You have deal makers, well connected business people who are involved in maybe funding lots, lots of different businesses, again, making connections. And again, one of the kind of key points is, is that effective ultra network, effective ultra ecosystem are well networked. Um, connections are easy to, are, are easy made. People are only kind of one stage uh, removed. So it's easy to find mentors, uh, easy to find board members uh, and, and, and so on. And then you'll also get the emergence of entrepreneurial service providers, lawyers, accountants who understand entrepreneurial businesses, not just large businesses. Uh, and you'll get institutional emergence, accelerators, networking organizations like Connect in, in, in San Diego. And all of this um, enables more spin-offs to happen, more entrepreneurial startups to happen. So you've got a virtuous circle. As more spin-offs get created, you get all these things happening on the previous slide. And you get a virtuous circle of growth. The more, the more role models you have, that creates legitimacy for, for further entrepreneurial activity. Spin-offs diffuse knowledge and expertise around the, the community. Um, the the labour markets become become richer and, and more 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 knowledgeable. Um, the more spin-offs you have, the more service providers um, who can specialise in all these different kinds of services. Um, once firms get to be 10 or 20 employees, they begin to start recruiting from outside the area, so they become mini talent magnets. But of course, at some point, the process of the music may stop, and, and some ecosystems may well go into reverse, as did Ottawa um, post post 2000. So that's kind of part one of what I was going to say, and I'm over halfway through my, my time, I'm afraid. So anyway, that was the context. Having done that work for OECD, I thought, well, I think it doesn't tell us how ecosystems kind of get started, what an embryonic ecosystem looks like. So I had study leave. I like coming to Canada. I uh, got good contacts in this area. I read Peter Barrera's uh, stuff from Ultra Vestas, who was picking up from about 2011, 2012, that things were happening in this region. So I thought, hey, this is a good place to come and do some research. So what I've done, I've, so I've been here for uh, about 30, I think today's my 33rd day away from home. I had four weeks in Halifax, four days in, in Newfoundland. So sorry about the ratio. But anyway. Um, so I mean, I'm relying a lot on the Ultra Vesta data. Peter does, does quarterly reports. Um, he uh, produces uh, a, da a daily article on something to do with ecosystem. Lots of other media coverage. Um, a couple of years ago, I was involved in doing a study of how the approach to venture capital is changing in Nova Scotia. Government's approach is changing. So I, I interviewed five people as part of that. And that's kind of worked into this study. And in the last four weeks, I did 27 face-to-face -face interviews with folk in Halifax, attended about attended several events, and since I've been here on, on Sunday, uh, thanks to Blair, I've had four interviews here and attended a, an event as well. Um, I've not really had a chance to kind of reflect on what, uh, what, what, what the, the Newfoundland interview. So what I'm talking about really is is the Nova Scotia uh, part of the story. So we think about well, what's the, the pre-existing Condition. Then we can, I say, we can think about this in terms of either Nova Scotia or the Atlantic Canada. A lot of unfavorable factors: peripheral location, distance to markets, um, geographic dispersed property. You know all this. Low, low density. Why, 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 why am I talking about it? Politically fragmented. No major urban center. Um, I don't mean long-term economically depressed region. 
rely on the equalization payment. Somebody said, the region's got a kind of culture of learned helplessness. We can't do anything ourselves. Uh, I thought it was quite an interesting observation. Resource-based industries. I think more critically, given the previous slide, lack of head offices, lack of technology-rich firms, lack of private R&D, so lack of talent magnets, dominated by branch plans, back offices, who don't employ the sort of people in the sort of jobs that are going to become um, entrepreneurs. Demographics, uh, an issue, wages relatively low, marginal tax rate relatively high. So um, not terribly a good environment for starting businesses. On the other hand, quality of life uh, is favorable. Universities doing research, high number of students. I mean, for, for Halifax's size, Dow has an enormous number of students. Um, not that much smaller than, than Glasgow, uh, Glasgow University. Um, especially international students. I was told in Nova Scotia there are more graduates per capita in engineering, applied science, maths, physical science than in any other Canadian province, that should be. Um, we've got the importance of the, the North, New, NBTEL, North, New Brunswick. For some reason, um, NBTEL was able to retain its own in-house R&D and technology development for much longer than the other um, provincial telecom companies. And that became a critical base from which various entrepreneurs emerged um, in, in recent years. But is the culture giving back? A lot of people mentioned the importance of Halifax as being an international airport. And within each of the cities, everyone's connected, uh, creating many different points of, of contact. Um, I mean, certainly in Halifax, I didn't need to walk more than about 15 minutes to, to get to any, any of my meetings. Uh, the events that I attended were very well, were, were very well attended. In a small city like Halifax, um, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, it's not time consuming. You're going to have to travel in from the, the suburbs to attend an evening event. So you get a lot more people perhaps attending um, events. Um, I haven't checked back properly on Peter's data, but certainly his latest count was 368. Uh, independent tech companies in Atlantic Canada. Um, two years earlier, it was only 260. Um, I haven't actually checked back any further. Of this 368, this were the dates when they were founded. Now, obviously, a lot of companies founded in early years would have closed down, but you can see how recent, um, re relatively recently formed, um, these tech companies are um, in the in the region. So, I mean, over two over 200 of the 368 are less than three years old. So. A lot, of, a lot of startups, a lot of new startups. As he, as he says, we're moving from a community of small experimental companies to a group that includes several high growth corporations with international reach. So it's not just small new startups. Some of them are actually generating a bit of traction. 130 with over $100,000 of sales. 30 with more than $2 million of sales. This is across Atlantic Canada. So something is happening. Something is definitely happening. Venture capital is being attracted from outside the region. Sequence Bio, I read the other day, has got investors from Silicon Valley, I think. Attracting acquirers from outside the region. Um, but the tech community is concentrated sexually and geographically. 70% of firms are in IT. Now, I recognize that IT can embrace all sorts of other sectors, so maybe that's not a terribly helpful definition. But over half of the firms are in Nova Scotia, and a third of them are in Halifax alone. So there's a kind of geographical um, concentration. Some helpful macro trends. Accor has been around for a long time, promoting entrepreneurship since 1988. Um, technological changes, the things that have been happening in IT, are making it much easier and much cheaper to start IT companies. Um, so perhaps some of these IT companies couldn't have started five or 10 years ago um, because it was too expensive or the technology, the platform didn't exist or whatever. And a lot of people have mentioned that the millennial generation as having a different culture. They don't want to work for other people. They're quite happy working in the so-called gig economy. Um, so that, that's a, a broader macro trend. So why Atlantic Canada? What's kind of triggered this, uh, this seeming entrepreneurial growth? Well, I think the first thing, we have to go back to NBTEL. Um, there was ownership changes, uh, which eventually forced out Jerry Pond and his technology team from NBTEL in about, I think, 2002, 2003. They were off to start 
uh, well, I think they, they spun off an IPO Magic, iMagic TV, I think it was, which was then taken over uh, by Alliance, I think it was, and ultimately closed down. Um, but anyway, there's rich technology and, and smart people um, who were floating around the, the New Brunswick uh, economy, started uh, tech companies, um, and then in 2011, 2012, we had these mega exits. Uh, I thought I meant to put the prices down, but you, again, you'll know the details. Q1 Labs was over 100 million, Radiant 6, I think it was 500 million or something like that. Go instant in Nova Scotia, only 70 million, but it was only 80, 18 months after the company had started. Ocean Nutrition, a slightly different story, because that involved one of the kind of uh, older generation entrepreneurs of John Risley starting that company. But what all that produced was, as the literature suggests, recycling of financial human capital, role models. Um, if you look at the GEM report, Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, the single most important influence on somebody's interest in starting a company is, do they know other entrepreneurs? Role models are critical. And often it's, in, it's not in the heroic sense of the word of the role model, it's seeing somebody just like you being successful and say, well, damn it, if he can be successful, and he was a thicko at school, I'm sure I could be more <laughs> successful. That's the, where the role model comes in. And it's attention grabbing. Uh, so they were really significant. Then at the same time, you, you, and independently, you got the launch of, of Dalhousie's Lean Startup uh, program with Ed Leach and Mary Kilfoyle. And they, be, they began to produce um, potential entrepreneurs. Something else I think that was important, at least in Nova Scotia, was the famous Ivory Report which really highlighted the, 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 the massive problems of the province of the region. Um, major social, I think it focusing very much on, on the demographics uh, and how that will affect the standard of living. The world is changing, we must change too or face the consequences. The only certainty is that the status quo is not an option. Now, I've talked to a lot of people about, well, what effect did Ivany have? And one response was, well, Lots of people kind of came up with initiatives and, and claimed it was justified by the Ivory Report. Now, that can be good or, or bad. But it did seem to prompt the, the, the Nova Scotia government into quite significant changes in the way the government was organized. They closed down the Department of well, ec, well, the Business, Economic Development, Rural Affairs and Tourism, uh, whatever. And um, that was the Department of 250. I think they shut that down, uh, replaced it with the Department of Business with 50 or less than 50 civil servants to be an advocate for business, not a supporter, a financial supporter of business. So something changed, changed going. That was another macro trend, another trigger, if you like. So perhaps going back to the Eisenberg, the, the Eisenberg um, circles, what have we got? Culture, undoubtedly raising awareness of entrepreneurship, more awareness of the possibilities of entrepreneurship um, in the region, particularly by young people. Although again, when I talk to the service providers, what should typical entrepreneur look like? They said it's everybody, everybody 18 to 60 plus. Very difficult to kind of uh, generalize um, on that. But it's pretty the young people. The idea that entrepreneurship is, is visible, being talked about, is being encouraged. It's seen as being feasible and credible. I know somebody made an interesting uh, point. More, more sophisticated conversations are happening. Entrepreneurs now know what a term sheet is, for example. I think that, was, that was the illustration for, for that. Oh, so there's a learning going on in the community uh, about some of the nuts and bolts of, of entrepreneurship, which is interesting. Human capital, entrepreneurs are emerging from universities, from research institutes and so on. Again, no specific source, uh, dominant source. Lots of support and training for entrepreneurs. University courses, not, not just at Dal, but at St. Mary's, University of New Brunswick, here is, is beginning um, as well. Um, You've got accelerators, incubators, mentoring events, lots of places now where people can learn uh, the basics of being an entrepreneur. So a lot, a lot of kind of feeder mechanisms then into, into, the, into the process. And so you can, you can almost say kind of hierarchy, the university courses maybe a relatively basic level of education about entrepreneurs, the accelerators are rather more detailed, uh, and more intensive learning, and some of the accelerators are moving towards um, the growth stages, supporting entrepreneurs have got going to help them to, to, to scale up. Um, I think that the co-op education and other kinds of university industry engagement, um, like, like Sandbox, um, like, like, like uh, University Springboard that they have in Nova Scotia, I think are important. 
because they bridge the gap between university for, for students in university and industry. Um, the students have got the technology knowledge, but they also get some domain knowledge. More importantly, I think, they, re they realize, students realize that, hey, there are jobs in Nova Scotia. There are jobs in, in Newfoundland. We don't have to go to Toronto to, to get jobs. And as they build up relationships with the companies through projects or whatever, that might be the way they'll, they'll, they'll get a job. So I think that's important. Problem, of course, is that, that there's a thin pool of skilled labor. Uh, labor markets are, are, are thin, uh, particularly mid and senior level. Uh, management is, is, uh, is missing. Lots of support for entrepreneurs. And we can see them in every, in every province. Uh, the purpose to make people better entrepreneurs. Uh, mentoring, events, collision spaces, then the sandboxes uh, to bring people together who might not otherwise connect. Somebody from engineering and somebody from, from the business school, uh, for example. There's a company that's quite prominent in Nova Scotia called Spring Loaded. It's built a, a, a power based knee brace, and that came out, I think, of, of the Lean Startup class. Three people from very different disciplines who would never otherwise have, have met. Um, lots of pitching and business plan companies. There's lots of, lots of um, infrastructure there to, to learn and become a better uh, entrepreneur, refine your ideas. Um, Match-ups and greet, and greet and meets to help students connect with companies. Uh, that happens through Volta, for example. Um, mentoring of students to help discover career paths. So it's not just the potential entrepreneurs who are being supported, but it's, it's the, the graduates uh, who might otherwise leave the province, who don't necessarily want to start a business, but might want to be employed in a, in a, in a business. Um, springboard, I think, is, is, is quite important. Again, supporting uh, the transfer of, of technology from universities to the businesses through student projects. Availability of finance, that's improved. Um, I think it's important that there's a, there is a layer of non-dilutive finance available from uh, IRAP, SRED, BDF. Uh, then you've got a layer of seed capital. Uh, then you've got some follow-on finance. Build Ventures obviously created a couple of years ago to provide that next layer of finance, a kind of million, couple of million dollars plus investment. And you've got external investors um, coming in um, as well. Uh, Colin, what's non-dilutive finance? What's well, grants, basically oh, grants. Okay. All the rest of the stuff is, is equity. And the danger, I think the danger of a system where, where you, you, the entrepreneur is having to sell some of their equity before they even get going is, is, is that they, immediately they've lost, um, say, 20% ownership of the business. So when they come to need big chunks of venture capital, they've got less equity to, to, um, to play with. They'll very quickly end up being a minority shareholder in their own firm. So I think that is actually, that's actually critical. Uh, that is something I think that ACOA in, in um, Nova Scotia um, developed. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, right, yeah, I've, I've seen so many, you know, okay, right. Um, one of the missing things, I think, is clearly we don't have big local markets. We don't have big populations, we don't have big, big firms um, to provide custom. Although I, I did pick up, and again, ultra, ultra investors picked this up, McCain has been involved with, like, four, well, I've told about four examples where McCain has got involved with innovative companies to be their first customer, taking the product work with the company on developing um, the product. Resin, Resin, I think, is one of the companies that I, I recall. So we need, we need more of that. Um, big companies to kind of re-engage. Re uh, I'm getting near the end. Um, lots of recycling. Um, and Jerry Pond, of course, is one of the key players. He, he, um, he, he had two, two of these mega, mega investments in, in New Brunswick. Uh, so he's... He, he's multi-millionaire. He's invested in Propel ICT, which is a pan-Atlantic pan uh, initiative. Jevin McDonald, who is behind GoInstant, was be, um, set up Volta uh, or, and put in the initial seed capital. You've got angel investors. The region is on the map. People realize that actually you can find good investment opportunities um, in this region. Uh, one of the exits, I forget which one it was, was the Canadian Venture Capital Association exit of the year. You got serial entrepreneurship. As I said before, you got, you got role models. Young people are now seeing examples of how you can be successful as an entrepreneur. Um, and of course, by selling companies, uh, it's, a, it's another form of inward investment, uh, probably a better form of inward investment. Salesforce would never have come to New Brunswick uh, had it not bought um, Radiant 6. I think what is also I found interesting is that this region has been prepared to look externally 
for ideas and uh, and uh, models. They've not looked in terms of in, in the academic literature. The, there's a lot of pipelines coming out of this region. So Baltus models on community tech, sandbox, sandboxes on MIT. People have come in from outside the region. So Jesse Rogers, the new CEO of Volta, has come from Ontario. Um, a lot of the expertise is, is non-local. A lot of the veg cap is non-local. Um, the, the guy who runs uh, Build Ventures, although he's a Nova Scotian, he learned the trade of being a venture capitalist in Boston and then came back to the, to the region. Um, I think universities have played a critical role or are playing a critical role here. They've recognized the importance of embedding entrepreneurship into their institutions. Um, they'll recognize the need to engage. In the case of Dow, their relatively new president has rewritten the kind of pillars of Dow, one of the four pillars being to contribute to cultural and economic vitality locally and globally by fostering creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship. I suspect there's not many universities around the world who would be as explicit as that about supporting uh, entrepreneurship. What else? I think ACOA and other government agencies have been critical. Uh, they are the funder of most of the infrastructure um, in, the, in the economy. But again, I can only speak really for Nova Scotia. The philosophy has been to, to kind of back smart people, provide the funding, but then step back. Um, again, Volta is a good example. They recognize the need for something like Volta. Jeff McDonald was willing to, to, to fund the startup and, and take a leadership role. And then government came in behind him to provide the funding. Somebody said, we set the table, step back and see what happens. I kind of quite like that, that idea. And that's, a, that's a, a, um, accepting that risk will happen. Indeed, some people said, government shouldn't be involved if there's no risk. We have to accept that if, if government is funding, there is a risk. Uh, there, which is why government is needed. Develop, uh, an attempt to develop pan-Atlantic initiatives, again, to overcome the scale problems. Jerry Pond is very much uh, all of this view that, you, that the individual provinces are too small to, to be seen as having their own, uh, their own ecosystem. We have, we have to work on a pan-Atlantic basis. And I'm picking up some sense from government that there may be a pressure to say, we need to maybe cut back on some of the organizations that we fund uh, we've got too many seem to be doing the same thing. And that kind of worries me, because uh, I don't think they, they do all do the same thing. And the more you kind of standardize, um, the, more, the more companies will kind of uh, find that uh, they'll not be provided with what they want. So I would, I would urge people to resist that pressure. It's still early days. Uh, but we're still 1.0 rather than 2.0. Lack of scale-ups is, is, is clearly one of, the, one of the challenges. Need more valuable companies. Why have we not got more scale-ups? The entrepreneurs simply want, want the money. And who, who, who can blame them? They want some financial security, uh, money in their, in their jeans pockets, as somebody said. Then they might start again. Um, lack of senior middle management talent to grow the company is an issue. Lack of growth capital, at least until Build Ventures has, has come along. Another observation, a um, woman called Doreen Massey, um, that she died earlier this year, a very prominent geographer talked about thinking about economies with a geological metaphor. So just like geology got stratas of rock, any economy has got stratas of economic activity that were kind of laid down at different points in the past. Um, so one of the questions, to what extent is this new entrepreneurial economy drawing upon what was here already uh, and benefiting from it? Um, Lack of reinvestment by wealthy families, the so-called Codfathers, with the exception perhaps of John Risley, who actually is a part of his first generation entrepreneur anyway. He's not inherited wealth. Very few family offices in Europe. I think a lot of these wealthy entrepreneurial families would have set up family offices to, 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 um, to invest in all sorts of things, including venture capital. Killick's an interesting example of, the, of, of this process. Not many others. So that's something that's, that's missing. Some people have said there's not as much reinvestment occurred as one might have expected or, or hoped. And most of the activity is in the IT sector. Um, again, I was struck with all this research money going into ocean tech and so on. Not an awful lot of spin outs from, from, from there. Although um, somebody I saw this week actually did, did tell me that, did make the observation that, that, uh, that, that actually there is IT in ocean. It's just that, that, that IT in ocean gets wet now and again, I think, with these, with these rates. Um, but certainly in, in, in Nova Scotia, there's a, lot, we're on, there's a lot of new investment going in to support the kind of an ecosystem for ocean. 
So there's something called Cove being developed, the old Coast Guard station in Dartmouth, which is going to be a kind of Volta plus. Um, and there's a new government-led in uh, incubator and so on. So people say to me, well, come back in two years, and we will see um, a more coherent ocean tech ecosystem in, in Halifax. Yes, that's right, yeah. So last couple of slides I think I wrote like last night. Um, just, I'm looking at last night, oh, I've not, I've not got a conclusion. So a couple of slides just to finish with a conclusion. Clearly, this is a long-term business. Unfortunately, government thinks in the short term. Government thinks in, in electoral cycles. This takes, uh, this takes a long time. I mean, look at your, your success story, uh, Verifin. Yeah, 10 years. 10 years to be an overnight success, as, uh, as somebody, somebody said. So actions today may not actually have any outcome or any visible outcome for several years beyond this, this government. Um, Ultra cultures takes a generation to show positive impacts. So what government should be doing, of all the players, is build on the strength of the economy, build and attract talent and knowledge. Because that's where you get your entrepreneurs from. You're going to need to have a knowledge base from which talented people can spit out as, as entrepreneurs. Try and make the place more sticky. So when people come here, they want to stay. And people who are here don't want to go. Uh, Anne Marcus then uses this phrase, creating stickiness. Government needs to take lots of small bets. I think in Nova Scotia they did. They spread their money out uh, to support lots of different things. Back entrepreneurial people inside and outside government. Again, I noticed the people I talked to uh, in government had, uh, were not career government people. They'd been outside and worked in business and come, come in and gone out and come in again sometimes. <laughs> uh, maybe that's where well, they have a, a, different, a different mindset. So including great, encourage great mobility between government and the private sector, I think is important. And the economy is interconnected. Government can't just intervene in one part of the economy because that will have ripple effects elsewhere. I mean, for example, uh, okay, we're going to shortage of seed capital. Right, let's create a government uh, seed, seed fund. Fine, well, all you do then is you help companies grow for a couple of years and then they need, they need follow on funding. And if, if you haven't created any, if there's no source of follow on funding, you just wasted your time providing seed capital. So you have to think systematically. Um, a lot of things that make a difference appear to be serendipitous, these mega exits. I mean, government can't do anything specifically to, to encourage that. But as, as I've tried to argue, these apparently serendipitous events can be traced back to developments in the past, um, like NBTEL, where knowledge was being embedded in the economy, smart people were, were focused um, there. Uh, without, without these actions, you wouldn't have got a Jerry Pond. You wouldn't have got to prepare ICT. You wouldn't have got an East Valley Ventures, which out of its returns from investing in Q1 and Radiant, has invested in 36 other companies in, in, in the region. So the past influences the present um, and the future in a whole variety of, of complex uh, ways. Well, that's me. Thank you. <laughs>